sorry for the delay, people. Um, this is the first time in two and a half years that I'm on a stage and my laptop hasn't been used that much lately. And it, I just plugged it into the s screen and it went, what are you doing? Um, it just refused to project to the screen. It's, I'm not doing that anymore. I'm, re I'm retired. Uh, you figured it out. So what we did, I borrowed Andy's laptop here. And I promised there were no viruses in the email that I just sent you. <laughs> and uh, uh, my um, spare uh, deck is on there with uh, screenshots because I, I, the Wi-Fi is a bit flaky here, so I have all the screenshots of everything that I wanted, that I wanted to show. So that just in case the Wi-Fi didn't work, I didn't realize my whole computer would say, nope, um, you've bought this fancy desktop, so I'd, I'd just refuse to help you now. Um, oh, well. So what are we doing? First of all, um, I'm going to go a little bit quicker to not take too much of your time into the break, uh, but getting through the story as well. Um, really quick, I'm a Dutchie. Uh, if you have uh, um, any questions during, uh, just bring them on. You don't have to wait until the end. Uh, it's all good. And um, so I'm a, I'm a data engineer. And the use case that I have and that I'm now going to show you in a, in a shorter version is that I work with developers who work with Azure SQL DB, but they write microservices. So uh, everything has its own SQL database. And I've, I've got about 20 of them now, but it could be 100 in a year from now. Who knows? And I wrote ADF to just grab me everything. Just, I just tell ADF, OK, here's my list of Azure SQL DBs. Please grab everything. Oh, by the way, there's a few tables that I do not want you to put into the data lake. Uh, just skip those, please. So I don't have any maintenance on it. If the developers create new tables, they just end up in the data lake automatically. And uh, I'll show you now how I do that. So this is now based on screenshots. <laughs> Let's see how that goes. Um, first of all, if you've never worked with Data Factory at all, that's OK. I'm going to uh, try and go from the beginning. If you've seen a bunch of data factories and you did a, a bit of interactive um, data factories already, you might, you might see something interesting, hopefully. We'll see. Um, is this? OK, this is a bit small. But what I have in the data factory, if you've worked with SSIS before, in SSIS, you would uh, create a package per thing that you wanted to do, right? Um, I myself have created whoa, one project was 800 packages, and it was dragging and dropping and clicking and saving. And then I thought, I'm never doing that again. And then along comes something called Bimmel. That is a language that you can use to generate packages. And ADF works a little bit differently. In ADF, you create the one package that does what you want but you parameterize everything. So you don't have to write or generate a whole bunch of pipelines. You just have the one, well, don't make it too complicated for yourself. Don't write the one pipeline that does it all, but maybe a few with, that does your use, that takes your use case and, and, build, and build that one. And the parameters can be a bit weird. Sometimes if you want to point a database to a different table, I want this table and then that table, you can do that in a loop, and I'll show you. But you can also just give it uh, one connection and a list of SQL databases on different SQL, Azure SQL servers and just have it loop through. But there's a, few, there's, a th there's a catch that you have to think about or else you'll get weird connectivity issues if you don't do that in separate pipelines. So what I have here is my data lake. So the demo lake storage, if you can read it, I, don't, I cannot zoom it because it's not my laptop. Um, that's my data lake. That's where everything ends up. And I have a metadata DB, very simple one. I'll, um, there's a screenshot later of what's inside it. And I have my source DB. I don't actually have one source DB. There's three in this demo. But I have like 20 of them. And I just have one source DB connection. Because they're all Azure SQL databases, Azure SQL servers, uh, 20 of them in, in my production thingy. And they have various databases. And I just have a, a list in the metadata DB that, that, that has the names of the SQL servers that I use. So let's see if that's here really small. I either have to put 
put my reading glasses on and look here what I'm doing or, <laughs> or look at the screen. Um, if, if you want to connect to your uh, data lakes in your databases, it's really easy from Data Factory. Data Factory has its own managed identity, which usually is the name, so it's inactive directly. It's like a service account that you can use to uh, get connectivity to your resources. And if everything just is in Azure, that works, you can just use that. You can also use SQL's uh, usernames and passwords and everything, but when all your resources are in SQL, in Azure, that's not needed. You can just uh, use the managed identity. Um, so what I've done here, is so my metadata DB is just one connection to the metadata DB, so there's no parameters that I've set up. But the other connection that I made has a few parameters. And uh, this is in the, in the linked service, not in the data set that you have. We'll look at the data set as well. But the linked service has a server name and a database name. And on the fly, I'm changing the connection to the SQL server to a different SQL server. I'm just looping through. Now, if you've tried that in a loop in Azure, in uh, Data Factory, you might have noticed a big fat error message. It says, wait a minute. I'm, I'm running in parallel here, because that's what Data Factory does. It tries to run in parallel as much as possible. And if you're trying to change the connection on the fly, it just goes, hey, oh, wait a minute. I was just connected to the SQL database, and now it just disappeared, because you've changed the connection of the link server. That doesn't work. But there is a trick. Um, Microsoft might say this by design, so that's not a trick. <laughs> but uh, you, have to, you have to do something. We'll get to that. So my data lake, yeah, this is, this is the, um, I'm writing everything in Parquet format, which works for me because it's nice and fast. And I have parameters for the directory that it needs to land in and the file name that I want to give it. And I have parameters that you set in the data set uh, where in the file path, I just give it the directory and the file name. And I, I get the directory and the file name from the database. So my directory is, this, is the schema, and the file name is the table name. Automatically, I just point uh, with my metadata to just save it there. And it just makes up the, the naming convention itself. So the data set for my um, source database now has four parameters. This is getting a bit weird, right? From the pipeline, I need to set the parameters for the data set, so which schema and which table name are you using. But I also give the data set the parameters for the server name and the database name, and the data set passes those on to the linked server. So you have the linked server, the data set, and then the pipeline. And the pipeline gives all the parameters to the data set. The data set uses two of them for itself because it is connected to a database and it uses the schema name and the table name to get stuff out, and it passes two of the parameters on to the linked server. So this is how it changes the server name uh, along the way. I if you don't use the trick, it will break, but we'll show you that. And this is how you set those things up. Because the linked server has that I'm using has parameters, I can set them from the data set. Inside the data set, I can say, OK, here are the parameters that you like. And for myself, the table name and the uh, schema name are these parameters. And later on, I'm actually also passing a query that I generate. I'll show you that as well. Going a bit, bit quick through the basics. Uh, here we go. So what I start with is I'm running a query that gets me the databases that I want to run on from the um, metadata DB that I have. Uh, the, do I have a screenshot from the for the query? Uh, oh. Screenshots are a bit all over the place. Yeah, here we go. So I've, I'm going back and forth through my uh, queries a bit. But what I'm doing, I run this query on my metadata DB, and it gives me the name of the SQL server that I want to connect to, the name of the database that I want to connect to, and an in, a part of an in clause that I can use on the metadata of the database that I'm connecting through of the tables that I want to skip. 
because the developers are using a table called build version and a table called error log. And I don't want that in my data lake. And there's some other tables as well that have to do with financial data that I can, I'm not allowed to have in my data lake. So I can just put what I want to exclude in a, in a table. So I don't tell this system what I want to have. I tell it what I don't want to have. And it will just skip that and give me the rest. So if the developers come up with new tables, I just get them. They just show up. Um, I even have a system that runs a bit of PowerShell on the metadata in Azure. The, because the developers tag their SQL Server resources that they use for the system in production. So I recognize that and put the name in the metadata automatically. So if they come up with a database, put it in production, it just lands in the data lake right away. Um, only thing that I have to do is go through and see if there's any tables that are new that I shouldn't have, delete them, put them in the exclusion list, and we're done. So this thing, I have to go back here. Uh, is that this? Sorry. Getting the right. So th that's the first query that you saw. This thing does a lookup of the, of the names, then goes into the for each database. And for each database, it just runs another pipeline. Uh, you could, is that here? Here. And this is the trick that you have to use if you're changing the connection of the linked server along the way. You have to do that in its own pipeline. If you change the connection of the, of the linked server inside the pipeline, the parallelism will, will be confused. It will go, oh, wait a minute, where did my connection go? But if you give the parameters to a separate pipeline that sets the linked server as a parameter, and that pipeline just runs on that SQL server, so you'd run 20, 50 pipelines, it doesn't matter, and they all have their own connection to the linked server, then you're good. Then you can run in parallel as much as you want, change the connection on the fly, it's all good. Uh, how do you run in parallel in ADF? Automatic. It just does it for you. Yeah, if you want a data factory to not run parallel, you have to slow it down. Um, but normally, if you don't do anything, like this for each loop, will run 50 threads at the same time or something. It will. Uh, it's really useful if you're querying a big database with lots of tables. It will run 50 queries on your database. So if your database is running on a hardware that you need to slow it down a bit, you have to set that. So what I'm doing inside, yes. What I'm doing inside that second pipeline, so now I've passed the parameters of the linked servers to that new pipeline. It sets the, the connection name of the SQL server. Now I need to get the tables that I want. So this second query um, grabs the metadata of the database that I'm connecting to and want to gra grab across. So I'm building uh, a, table, a list of tables and schemas from the metadata of the database that I'm connected to. That looks like this. It's at the end, so I have to scroll a bit. Sorry about that. No? Here? Yes. That looks like this. So I'm generating a SQL statement with all the table names in it. And I'm also skipping the geography type because it's not compatible with the parquet format that I'm using to write. So use your own thing if you wanted to do something else, or you can cast it to something if you, I just don't need the geography type. So I'm skipping it, easy. Um, and the, um, this is a query that I'm showing you in Management Studio, but in my data factory, I've, I'm putting the parameters in. You can see here where I do where t.name, not in test, but actually that's where I paste the parameter name that I got from my, from my first query in the loop, where it had the not in list, the list of tables that I, wanna, uh, that I don't want to have. I just paste that in, here, in there. So for each database, I get a, a query that I can run that grabs the metadata, uh, gives me a list of tables, excludes the tables that I don't want to have, and then runs that, um, and I, it, it gives me the list of tables. So I can run through that and get them all. So that happens, let's see, in here. So I'm two loops deep, right? Um, my first loop 
goes to my metadata, grabs the list of servers and the tables that need to be excluded. And the second loop starts a pipeline that connects to the destination, runs a query on the metadata, gets all the tables and schemas except for the ones that I got in the, in the first loop by just inject, ingesting that not in, in part. So basically now I have a for each loop that with the valid tables and schemas that I need. And it's dynamic, right? I only have to use the exclusions, and I only um, uh, have to maintain the list of, data of SQL servers, and this thing does the, does the rest. It just runs every night, grabs everything, and you, as you can see, the server name, database name, schema name, and table name are parameters that I put in. So if you run this thing, connects to the metadata, connects to the databases, grabs all the, all the tables and schemas, moves to the, uh, um, the data lake, creates a directory with the name of the schema and the name of the table name, and puts the parquet files in there. So that refreshes every night, overwrites everything. Um, how am I doing on time? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I did talk faster. <laughs> all right. Um, Next thing I'm working on, and it w was a bit too much to show here, especially, especially if you're using screenshots and not the real thing. Um, the developers have now started to use uh, change date and insert date on some of the tables that are getting bigger. And I've already got a query. I can't show you here, but I'll, I'll figure out to put, put it on GitHub or something that can actually go to the metadata and go, if this table has a change date, use that in the where clause. Generate a query that uses the change date in the where clause. Does it doesn't have it? OK, then don't put it in the where clause. Just stick it there if you've got it. So as soon as a developer goes, um, I'm putting a change date and an insert date in here, it just starts grabbing deltas instead of the whole table all the time. And you can put in the metadata whatever you want, right? OK, I don't want deltas because that change date doesn't really work yet, so I can just exclude, don't use delta. And my system will just go, OK, well, then I'll grab everything. This is. Um, so if you've never seen ADF before, and you see me go through this thing and go, link service, data set, par parameter, this might be a bit confusing. Uh, I'm happy to show you when this is done on my laptop. I just can't show it on the screen because my laptop refused to connect to the thing. My apologies for that. Um, and if, if you want to steal my code, if you want to have it, no problem. Um, Andre, come on at gmail.com. Send me an email. I'll reply with the code, you can, uh, with, the, with, the, with the whole thing. You can have it. It's totally fine as a template or whatever you want to do. Um, so I, I raced through this really quickly. I hope I didn't confuse everybody. And I've got one minute left. <laughs> um, does anyone have any questions about this thing? The one minute. Did I confuse you enough so you don't have it? You can't come up with a question. There is a question. There's a couple of questions. Sorry? Ah, how, do, how do I create the parquet files? That's built into ADF. You can just say, I want parquet files. Uh, there's a few things that you have to keep in mind. From, data, from Azure SQL database, you use the built-in uh, services that can just create parquet files. If you're going through an agent that you've installed on a VM because you want to get something from databases on-prem, you have to install a Java virtual machine or it w because it has to create the parquet files there. But it will just create it for you. And it's time. If you have any questions, just come forward. Um, I'll be here for a sec. And uh, I hope I didn't confuse you too much. Thank you. Everyone.